Okay. Um, so probably it's uh, three minutes past 3 p.m. So I think uh, it's time to uh, start the um, very first uh, science seminar of AgriForward CDP project. So um, I see uh, 38 attendees on, on the Zoom conference and I'm hoping that some more people joining in the YouTube live streaming as well. So I'd like to welcome you all uh, to this, uh, this a new event, uh, the science seminar series of uh, agri-food robotics, uh, CDT. So my name is Fumiya Ida. I'm a, a deputy director of the CDT uh, project and uh, uh, the main host of um, uh, the science seminar series. So for those who don't know this uh, science seminar, uh, the Agri-Foods, uh, Agri-Forward CDT project, I'd like to just briefly introduce what is this is about. So this project is uh, uh, sponsored by EPSRC, uh, Research Council UK, um, uh, to, with the aim of um, training 50 PhD students in the next eight years to um, specialize in agri-food robotics uh, research. So um, we have a, a number of industry partners and number of academic partners in University of Cambridge, University of Lincoln, and the University of East Anglia. Um, and um, the idea of this is really trying to uh, make a step change in the area of agri-food robotics research to, in, um, to uh, tackle the challenges in agri-food uh, manufacturing sectors. Um, so since we have so many industry partners and academic partners, uh, it would be nice to have uh, uh, many different kinds of events uh, to get people together. Um, and this is the first uh, attempt of this kind that uh, we want to invite um, all of the uh, CDT students and academic partners as well as the industry partners while uh, inviting uh, uh, eminent lecturers uh, in the field of agri-food robotics. And the first um, uh, event of this kind, uh, this time, so science seminar series, we are planning to do it um, from now on every month, a second or third a Friday of every month. Uh, and I'm very pleased to have a very honorable first uh, speaker uh, Dr. Matthew Howard from uh, King's College London. So um, uh, Matthew and I have been working together for a long, long time in the area of uh, agri-forge, uh, agricultural robotics in the last five or six years. And uh, I thought he's the, um, um, the best uh, lecturer for this series because he's very enthusiastic about this field. And uh, um, he has a very visionary ideas about how uh, research and uh, um, impact in the industry can happen together. So I would have, um, I'm very happy to have them Matthew as a first speaker in this uh, lecture. And I, uh, here is the uh, brief background of uh, Matthew. Uh, he did the P uh, PhD in the University of Edinburgh in the specialization in machine learning. And he is looking for uh, different uh, areas of applications in his uh, knowledge in uh, robotics and machine learning. Um, and in this particular talk, he's uh, going to uh, give a lecture about uh, his research with his students funded by AHDB um, on the Growbot project. And uh, um, AHDB is obviously one of our core partners of uh, AgriForward CDT project. So this is gonna be very nice fitting uh, to the overall aim of the science uh, seminar series. So I'm very much uh, looking forward to uh, the lecture of Matthew and we're looking forward to your experience in this field as well as uh, you can encourage um, the future generations of um, our students to uh, going toward this direction of the research in the future. So I hand over the, uh, the floor to Matthew and then I i uh, like to um, give the microphone to you. Uh, looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, so uh, I think you need to transfer or stop sharing screen so I can bring my slides up. 
Okay, have you? Okay, yeah. So maybe. So can you see uh, anything? Yes, yes. Yes, so okay, great. Thanks a lot. So thank you very much. Uh, well, firstly, for the kind invitation and all these kind words, you're, you're flattering me enormously. Um, uh, and thank you also for everybody to come uh, and uh, attend this talk. So I'm, I'm very pleased to talk about this. I think it's really exciting, the, the new CDT that you've got set up. And um, uh, as Fumia says, I've been um, uh, working broadly in this area for, well, more years than I can count now, maybe four or five years. Um, uh, and it sounds like you've got a really exciting group of uh, institutions and people involved in it. Um, so yeah, so the title of my talk is Automation Through Grower Reprogrammable Robotics. Um, and I want to acknowledge our sponsors, of course. So uh, this is the work that I'm talking about is from the EPSRC, partly sponsored by the HDB as well, and also Vitacress, who are a large uh, salad grower um, down in the south of England. Um, so maybe just a few words about myself and where I come from. So uh, I'm from King's. Uh, we're in central London. Um, this is actually a view from one of our, our meeting room windows. So you can see we're really in the heart of, the heart of London. And yes, it is uh, pretty empty at the moment with all the coronavirus stuff going on. Um, and at King's, I, uh, I lead up the, the robot learning lab. Um, so some of the kind of key words are the things that my lab is interested in uh, uh, sort of written up on the slide there. But I think the, the picture gives you the main summary of what, what we do. Um, so we're, we're very much interested in, in recording and analyzing uh, human behavior, um, even down to the muscle level. Um, we take data about that. Uh, we derive machine learning algorithms to work with that data and um, uh, we, we use that, that kind of learning approach to derive controllers for, for advanced robotic systems. So this is maybe uh, an odd combination of a central London-based researcher who's interested in human motor control to be, to be working with, with agriculture and, uh, and plants. Um, but I think uh, if you go around the UK and visit uh, sort of horticultural production sites, the, the reason why this is in, uh, you know, a natural fit for us becomes clear. So uh, what if hopefully you can see the video here, what you see here is uh, a video taken on a, on a relatively small size uh, ornamental um, uh, horticultural producer. So they produce plants for sort of garden centers and stuff. Um, people doing various tasks around, around that site. Uh, so things like uh, grading and collation and propagation of small ornamental plants, the kind of plants that, you know, you, you buy in from, a, from, a, from a, a garden centre and, and plant in your back garden. And, and the picture is that it's really very much heavily human manual labour intensive. Um, Looking at a slightly sort of bigger production site, so this is uh, this is at Vitacrest actually. Um, so this is part of their um, fresh herbs production line. They have a certain amount of um, automation machinery. You can see see some conveyoring there. You can see some um, to the top left of the picture is uh, uh, a seeding machine which fills these pots with compost and puts seeds in them. Uh, but still, walking around this site, you see lots and lots of people involved manning and tending these machines. And this is, um, you know, this is because of the kind of nature of the of the the product that they're handling. So plants are uh, variable biological, uh, you know, organisms, um, and it's very hard to to come up with good automation solutions that fit all of these, you know, all the varieties of plants that you see. They're delicate, they're easily damaged. There's, you know, there's lots of issues, technical issues. Um, now, those are important things, but I think one of the big things that really makes robotics, uh, you know, have a great potential for, for, for impact in this area is actually more related to the workforce and labor uh, issues. So the, the kind of uniform picture that I get from all of the all of the kind of industry sites that I've visited is that it's really hard to get people willing to work in this in this area. 
um, and it's really expensive. Um, so, you know, producers have the problem of having to pay their staff. Currently, they're having to pay them at the national living wage, which makes it quite expensive considering the margins that they're making on their produce. Um, internationally, not only in the UK, but internationally, it is known that this is a, a sector that is generally or seems to be unappealing to the younger generation. So the demographics of farmers and growers, uh, you know, means that we, we basically have a very aging population in this sector. People just don't see it as a, as a career path for some reason. And locally, we've got some local problems like Brexit, of course. You know, a lot of the work is uh, seasonal. Um, it's seen as relatively low skilled. Um, and it, it largely relies on migrant labor from currently the EU. And Brexit obviously is a, is a factor that is sort of discouraging people there. And currently with coronavirus, uh, you know, you just can't get people in past the borders because of all the quarantine. Um, and there's, you know, there's broader questions that you have to ask there. Um, you know, do you want the potential for transmission of diseases? So these, you know, people here who are handling uh, foodstuffs, you know, is there a, a biosecurity problem of people handling, uh, you know, these foodstuffs? So it, it seems to me like a natural place where robotics ought to be able to play a role. Um, so where are their solutions? So I'm sure within the CDT, there's lots and lots of different sort of research topics and interests uh, going around. And I'm sure you all have ideas about how you might bring robotics into, into this area. Um, today, what I'm gonna sort of drill into and, and dig into some of the details of is uh, this area of collaborative robots and in particular, um, adaptive robots. So robots that learn uh, from, from demonstration. So this video is kind of a little, a little illustration of that. So this is teaching a, a little robot, a sort of toy robot arm, how to pick up cherry tomatoes and put them in the cup. Um, and the way that this robot is taught is essentially you, you press a button to put it into teaching mode, and then you take it through the actions that you think it should, should take to, to do that picking operation. And then once it's got that data, it learns from it, and then it's uh, uh, able to reproduce the task uh, autonomously. Um, now in the, in the machine learning community, uh, programming by demonstration or learning from demonstration is, is an enormous area. Um, there's loads of different uh, flavors and different algorithms and different approaches um, to doing this. So, you know, we're not the inventors of this. But uh, I think they all pretty much follow this same kind of structure where you're, tar you're starting with a human somewhere and that human is, is giving demonstrations of some particular task. Um, you're recording data from the human and that, you know, in a human set setting that could be, or a robotic setting that could be things like muscle activities or kinematics or whatever. You take that data, you derive models, so you build up models, for example, of you could be directly of control policies or it could be of uh, performance metrics or something like that. But somehow from those models, you should be able to drive a controller and then you pass the controller over to the robot and hopefully the robot does the task. So it reproduces the task that you taught it. Um, and if all goes well, then great. Uh, and if all doesn't go quite well, then um, you can actually close the loop and you can say to the robot, well, the robot can sort of come back to the human and say, can you, can you give me some more uh, training? Can you give me some more demonstrations or some information about where I'm going wrong? So roughly speaking, that's, you know, in a nutshell, what this, this approach is um, all about. Now, as I say, there's a, is it an enormous amount of research in this area, but I think one of the areas that is really underserved in that, in that field is what about the person? What about the user of this kind of technology? Okay, so let's assume that all of this learning stuff works. Um, how do we actually introduce this to, to um, potential end users such as uh, uh, growers or, or workers on a horticultural site? So that's what I'm gonna, gonna focus on today. Um, so I think that we really need to think a bit about how to teach human teachers this technology. Um, and there's, there's lots of different issues that you could think of to, to study in this area. But I think the key thing 
that we really care about when we're using these learning approaches is generalization. So how can we achieve it? So what do I mean by generalization? That means, um, can we teach the robot in such a way that it can cope with situations that it hasn't necessarily seen in its training data? So when it was being taught. So sort of as a motivating example, um, think about this simple kind of horticultural task, which is uh, plant plug disposable. So each of these, uh, well, here we have a, a plant tray uh, and it's filled up with these little plant plugs um, with little succulent uh, plants. And the idea here is that uh, some of these may be unhealthy, so we want to remove them and put them in a disposal bin. And then um, we can refill the tray with healthy plants to fill up the gaps, okay? Now, if you're teaching the robot how to do this task, you know, a simple thing to do is to take it through the motions, show it, um, uh, you know, how to pick a plug up and how to move it over to the bin. Um, but the thing is that this tray contains 100 plant plugs. And how do you get it to pick from any place in the, in the tray? Um, now, really, a dumb way to do this would be to uh, teach it the movement for every single one of these plant plugs. Um, OK, that, you could do that. And that might work. But that, you know, that's going to take you a lot of time. So what we'd rather do is give it a few key demonstrations. So let's say these blue lines. And then hopefully from these key points, uh, it will be able to do picking from many other points. So let's say if we wanted to pick up the, the plant at this red point here, it would it would use its knowledge from those those demonstrations to to, to plan the correct uh, picking uh, movement there. Um, so that's that's the generalization uh, problem. And I think this is not straightforward. You know, even though it looks like a simple problem, it's not straightforward for a nursery worker to understand uh, how that how that should should really work how to select these these demonstrations so the i'm going to describe in a bit of detail a particular experiment we've done addressing that task uh, and we're interpreting this experiment within the framework of a of a model that we've we've been developing over the last couple of years um, along with my student aaron senna um, where we kind of explicitly try to model um, this interaction between a teacher and a learner in this kind of context, okay? And I think one of the things that is key here is that we're going to explicitly acknowledge, we're going to acknowledge from the start that we know that the teacher is going to be imperfect. So the, the teacher doesn't, you know, is not an expert. So typically in a lot of these machine learning researches that you see, people assume that the teacher is really, really good at the task and therefore is really, really good at teaching the the, the learner, but that I think we, we, we've got to release that assumption. Um, so the way that we're, we're modeling this is that we have a teacher who's selecting a, a set of um, demonstrations to give to the learner. The learner is from that demonstration or set of demonstrations producing some control policy. Um, using that control policy, they can then produce executions. That is to say, they can make attempts at the task. Um, and of course, the the teacher then can be observing those executions uh, and the teacher internally will be interpreting them. So they will be thinking about what they think the, the learner, the robot has actually learned. And from that, um, be selecting their next choice of demonstration to give to the, give to the learner. Okay. And we've, we're, we're acknowledging or, or we believe there that there are um, things that we can't possibly know about the teacher. So there's going to be hidden human biases or preconceptions about how the learner is learning uh, that are going to affect that interpretation and therefore uh, affect how the teacher is um, uh, generating these demonstrations. So the question that, that the experiments I'm going to describe really get at here is, can we somehow use feedback from the learner? So can we influence these choices of execution so that we can guide our teacher to be a better teacher. So it's a, it's a two-way process, the, the learning and the teaching in this, in this scenario. So this is just a little video to kind of give you a concrete feel for what the, um, how the experiment 
that I'm describing uh, actually ran. Um, so as you can see, we've got the plant tray, we're picking up plant plugs and we're disposing them. Uh, the demonstration involves kinesthetic teaching, so that's moving the robot um, physically um, to, to show it what to do. You've got an idea there of roughly how long it takes to give one demonstration, so a second or two. Um, and this is what we're able, well, what the robot is able to give as feedback. So the robot will play back, um, the, well, it can play back the, the demonstration, for example. Um, that's roughly how long it takes for the robot to make this picking operation. Um, and we can we can fit, play around with the feedback by, for example, selecting different points on the plant tray for the for the robot to do the picking operation uh, on. So well, I'm going to formalize, you know, sort of the the way that we've tested this by, you know, presenting you a few different uh, hypotheses that we that we wanted to test. So we were interested in in testing firstly whether feedback influences teacher behavior um, so first hypothesis is giving do it if we give feedback through through this approach of playing back motions um, will that influence the teacher's behavior compared to if the teacher just gives a, a batch of demonstrations and then effectively walks away right the, you give your demonstrations you assume that the robot has learned everything and then uh, you know, Bob's your uncle, hopefully the, the, the robot um, is able to reproduce the task. So first hypothesis is feedback will probably give some, some uh, improvement, but we're, we're not clear on that. Um, and the second hypothesis or second and third hypotheses were about um, the kind of feedback. So the types of feedback that we could give here, well, we, we identified a few um, sort of use case scenarios. So the simplest uh, possible feedback, I think, is that you just replay the demonstration. Okay, so actually in this, um, in this video here, you'll have noticed that the demonstration was given on this bottom left plant plug, uh, and we can just get the robot to replay that last, uh, you know, what it would do if it was asked to pick that same bottom left plant plug out. Um, the second option would be, uh, self-selected feedback. So let's say um, we, we give the teacher some responsibility and so we, we sort of credit them with some knowledge of how this is working. So the teacher can say to the robot, okay, I've shown you this plant plug. I've shown you how to do the picking there. Uh, what would you do if I asked you to pick this plant plug over on the other side? Okay, so we can, we can get some, you, know, you could get some idea of generalization from that hopefully. Um, alternatively, the sort of other condition that we looked at was if if the researchers, so us knowing how the, the machine learning algorithms are working, we said, well, after every demonstration, give a playback for each of these five points that we've chosen, okay, sort of indicated by the red circles. So we decided these five points because we thought, well, this gives you a good um, sort of coverage of the space, you know, the four corners and some point in the center that will give us a good approximation short of picking every single plant plug gives a good approximation of how well the, the robot has learned the overall task. Um, and the last hypothesis that we wanted to test um, is a little bit more general. So we were hoping to see that uh, teaching efficiency would improve um, between episodes as a participant gains some understanding or some experience of, of, um, of this teaching progress. Um, so just a little sort of side note, so with the um, experiment uh, or the results that I'm going to talk about were for 36 uh, participants, they were recruited from a nursery, so these are actual horticultural workers, these are not roboticists or people with any sort of prior knowledge. Uh, we had a gender balance, so hopefully there's no kind of uh, gendered effects in this, in the experiment. And before I sort of jump into the results, uh, I'll give you a few examples of, of, of teaching behavior that we saw from that population of, of workers. Um, 
So in these in these uh, pictures, um, so the left hand panel of A or B is the demonstrations, and the right hand panel is the um, uh, the playbacks that the robot would do. Um, and the little crosses are the locations of the plant plugs on that plant tray. So you saw we saw a really wide variety of of teaching behaviors. Um, so, for example, this participant decided to give all of their demonstrations in these, these seven points um, here. Um, for some reason, they, they thought that, that was enough and, and the robot wouldn't need to know anything about the bottom left corner of the, of the plant tray. But sure enough, the, you know, the robot, when it learns from that data, learns a reasonable model for the places where it's seen data and it learns pretty badly where you've given it no indication of what, what it should do. Um, so it's really, for example, here, you're really missing that target plant plug location. Um, but then again, some, some people seem to get it relatively easily. So, you know, this participant uh, chose to give their demonstrations in the four corners uh, and that resulted in pretty good performance for the robot. So it's pretty much hitting every um, picking point. So there's, you know, there's already quite a wide variation, but we can see already that you know, some people are gonna are gonna struggle with this task if they're introduced to a robot without any kind of uh, training. So these are the the results from that particular experiment, um, and I'm gonna kind of try and unpack this a little bit for you. Um, so this plot over here on the left is showing the uh, teaching efficiency uh, for each of those different conditions. So no feedback replay feedback, uh, the batch, so that's the four, cor four corners in the center, as feedback, or self-selected feedback. And we're, uh, um, we're measuring efficiency here by uh, the proportion of, of picking points that the robot can do a successful pick with. Uh, the, um, so that compared to the number of demonstrations that, uh, that the person had to give, okay? Um, and yeah, so the symbols will, well, we'll get into the symbols in a moment. Um, so the first thing to sort of note here is that there seems to be no support for hypothesis one. So that is to say that in self-selected or replay feedback, there actually, these are no better than no feedback at all, okay? So the effic teaching efficiency in those cases where they had replay or self-selected feedback was no better than if you gave no feedback of what the robot had learned. And that's kind of interesting on two levels. Um, one thing is that replay feedback is a pretty common approach to feedback. Um, you know, you see it a lot in, in, uh, in research that proposes programming by demonstration. And actually that's a terrible way to give feedback to your teacher. Uh, well, it's no better than no feedback at all. It's not very surprising that the teaching efficiency is not great there because if you're just replaying what, what you've just shown the robot, then that doesn't tell you anything about what the robot is gonna do in a different circumstance. So sort of from a machine learning perspective, that it kind of makes sense. But interestingly, in the self-selected case, uh, so the fact that that's no better than no feedback, what that sort of implies is that um, for our population, they had no idea how to test whether the robot had learned the task or not, right? So they could they could choose any location on the plant tray for a picking operation, um, but they it seems like they've chosen locations which didn't really give them any information about that. It didn't improve their efficiency at all. So that already sort of leads to one suggestion is, well, we need to give them some knowledge or some training if we're gonna ask them to work with these collaborative robots, um, you know, to do this kind of operation. So the second, second point from the results is that there was support for the hypotheses two and three. So that's to say the batch feedback does improve teaching efficiency and that's pretty clear from the, from the plot. Um, but, so we found there's a statistically significant difference between, between the batch feedback and all the other cases. Um, and that's, you know, that's good news because that means that we can actually get some gains, uh, you know, on the teaching efficiency if we pro provide uh, appropriate feedback. And, you know, that goes to our initial um, 
question, which was, you know, can we somehow influence the teaching behavior um, through through appropriate responses in the robot? And and the answer is clearly yes, we can. Okay, so that's that's interesting. Um, it's um, it's maybe not surprising from a, a machine learning perspective that that kind of feedback is useful because, as I've said, it it covers a lot more of the space, so you you do get uh, an idea of the um, of the generalization from that. Um, but maybe if we're thinking about deploying these kinds of robots, we want to build in this kind of feedback mechanism for naive users um, of this kind of technology. Um, and finally, there was a really interesting fact that there was no support for hypothesis four. So teachers did not improve in efficiency between episodes of learning. So you can see on the on the plot here, we've um, I've plotted out uh, the the efficiency for the first, second, and third trial of teaching. So let me explain what that means. So effectively, each we gave them three chances to teach the robot this task, and after each uh, you know, run of learning, they we reset the robot's level of knowledge, and and so it's sort of started from scratch each time. So. Um, it's a little bit disappointing that they didn't learn from experience, I guess. Um, but I can sort of say that even if that was the case overall, um, in this batch, the batch feedback um, case was the one case where we did see uh, at least anecdotally that uh, difference. So you can see that the triangle, the third trial of teaching in that case, um, had the highest efficiency out of the out of the three trials in that case, but but um, potentially because they only had three uh, goes at this this task, um, that was uh, um, uh, they, that's probably why overall we didn't see a general improvement in in uh, efficiency. Um, maybe it's interesting to to look a little bit at the failure cases um, that you see in the data. Um, so we saw. Um, kind of three kind of patterns of failure where people were doing sort of bad teaching practice. Um, so the first is you quite often saw um, uh, sort of poor coverage. So here, for example, is a case where a participant gave demonstrations all on this one corner, and and so it doesn't really give much information about the the uh, rest of the space. Um, we saw. Uh, a lot of cases of what we might call ambiguous demonstrations or, or non-informative ones. So here's an example where a person has given multiple demonstrations to a particular point. So, I mean, that um, that may be natural to you to, to as, a, as a teaching strategy if you're teaching a person because, uh, you know, you tend to uh, uh, improve your performance over multiple trials. But uh, for the robot, that effectively doesn't give the robot any further information. So after the first demonstration, it doesn't get any further information about that point. Um, so that's because of the way that the, the robot is learning. So this person didn't get that, and therefore this was a, a not a particularly good um, uh, uh, teaching approach. And then finally, um, we also saw quite a few cases where people were actually wrong in their own demonstrations. So for example, this person in this particular demonstration was trying to show the pickup task to this point integrated by the cross. Uh, but actually the location they went to do a pick was somewhere between these two points. Okay, so their stated aim was different from what they actually did and that was inconsistent and therefore uh, sort of confused the robot a bit. So I think even with this very sort of simple um, experiment, there's some interesting recommendations from the perspective of if you wanted to deploy this kind of, of robot, and it sort of tells you something about how you how you need to provide some kind of training. Uh, it's not enough just to hope that the AI does it all. Um, so I've I've been asked to keep the talk relatively short, so I'm going to sort of stop there and give a quick summary. Um, I can show you some flashy videos and some exciting sort of next step stuff if we have time a bit later. Uh, but so just to sort of quickly summarize, so I think pun fully intended, there are a lot of low hanging fruits in automation in this sector. 
Um, I think that uh, the great and the exciting thing about collaborative robots and robots that use learning is that they put power in the hands of the growers. So we as roboticists are not prescribing how they should be using the robots. Um, they can actually control that to some extent themselves. However, that has the big caveat that uh, you do need to give people an introduction to, to how these robots are working and you have to give some consideration of their usability for them to actually really be effective and efficient. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll tie up there um, and I'll open to any questions. All right. Um, thank you very much, Matthew, for wonderful uh, presentations. Um, I think uh, this is really representing, you know, how the science and the um, actual impact in the industry can come together and the really beautiful topic uh, you, you chosen for, for an HDB project. Um, so I just want to move to some uh, Q&A session. So if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand or uh, put the question in the, um, the chat window. Uh, let me just start with the first question I want to um, I, I have during my your talk. So I, I think you know the the generalization is really the holy grail of uh, you know, machine learning or robotics in general. Um, and uh, but but you know you have really nicely shrink it down to the problem you can address in a, in a in tangible and practical way. Uh, what what do you think is the um, the other easy low hanging fruits generalization problem in, in this field in agri-food agri uh, robotics. And uh, what, what, what is in general, um, you know, make this field of agri-food robotics special in the context of a generalization problem in general? Uh, I'm not sure what is the low, I mean, I think there's low hanging fruit in the sector in the sense that a lot of the re robotic technology that is out there and available already can be introduced directly into industry. So, um, so that's, I think that's the sense that I'm meaning this, but I think in terms of the generalization, there's some really, uh, I think there's some really interesting problems that we can address. I'm not sure if they're easy, but I think they're interesting. Um, so one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is the varieties of, of the same kind of well, the variety of uh, one or other plant. So let's say, for example, you're processing lettuce, right? I know this is something close to your heart, from you. Um, <laughs> so we, we effortlessly uh, handle iceberg lettuces, little gem lettuces. Um, uh, we also effortlessly handle things like rocket and these bagged salads. So I wonder whether there is a way in which we can generalize at a, at a force level manipulation of these very similar but clearly somewhat different um you know varieties of the same plant mm. um and i think that's probably going to be uh, i think that's going to be a multi-faced um problem to sort of address because it's it's really about i think force manipulation uh you know appropriate control of impedance when you're when you're handling these things but there must be commonalities between those plants that you can exploit. So let's... Do you think you can solve um, your problem at the moment if you have a lot and lot of data available? Or is it because you don't have much data is so difficult at the moment? Actually, no. So I think um, a lot of people feel like the more data you have, the better you will learn. But actually, that's, that's exactly the wrong approach, I think. What you need to do is do extremely high quality, small sets of data. Um, I mean, the, the analogy is with the plant disposal um, sort of problem, right? So rather than giving it 100 demonstrations to every plant plug location, which is a lot of data, you've got to choose the right locations that allows it to learn effectively. So, and I think there's, there's some really exciting work coming out of the machine learning community about how you select data sets um, uh, in an efficient way rather than just this kind of brute force, throw as much sort of big data as you can at it. Yeah. Very interesting. So, so we got the one question in the chat window. Uh, great talk, interesting insight on human teacher approach. 
I would like to know if you have experimented with direct training using the laws of physics, localization of manipulator, using uh, triangle equa uh, equations of the manipulator, using uh, uh, a com completely understand its limitations in more complex applications. I wonder if it would be more efficient uh, in, uh, if it's known, a uh, repetitive environment. Uh, wow, that's a long, let me, can I bring <laughs> up the text so I can see it? Uh, uh, direct training is a lot of physics. Yeah. Uh, yeah, direct training using the laws of physics. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, not sure if I exactly understand what you mean by that, but I think probably one thing that I can say towards that is that we we do look at um, how we can combine analytical models with learning approaches. So we bring in uh, prior information about the dynamics, um, you know, based on equations of motion, uh, and sort of try to combine that with statistical estimations from the machine learning side. So for example, we might um, set up a, a parametric equation that describes what we think is the physics of, of the way in which something we're manipulating will behave and then um, learn the errors between that model, which is necessarily going to be an approximation and what we see physically uh, in the data. So, and that's, I think that's an area that is um, not necessarily something that my group is specializing in, but I think that you can certainly find research in that direction in this, in this community. Mm. Yeah. So, so you, you have applied at the moment for the uh, geometry generalization problem, uh, that's what I understood, right? Uh, yes, so yeah, so you could, you could say that this is, the, the plant plug task is largely a kinematic, so geometric. Uh, right, but you yeah. can also apply that to different um, concept of a parameterization. It's not only geometry, but for example, you can generalize force excited on the plant, or um, you know, the uh, stiffness and so on and so forth. Yes, yes, yes. So there's, um, I think that's an active research area. Um, so historically, uh, a lot of programming by demonstration has been based on the kinematics. I think largely because it's very interpretable um, but certainly there's no mathematical reason why you couldn't take it to dynamics i think that the challenge there and it's an interesting point of view from from how you teach this is it's it's i think it's a quite non-intuitive uh, way to give feedback to a teacher um, how to give feedback about what are the right kinds of forces to apply um, mm. yeah what would be the other uh, agricultural or food manufacturing process you could you know, use your theory or framework uh, in a practical way? Uh, other, well, so we are, um, well, we're, we're broadly uh, exploring this in different areas and uh, I think it's hard to, so it, there's such a diversity out there. We could be doing uh, fruit processing, for example, or we could be looking at, um, uh, well, we've been mainly focusing on, on this uh, ornamentals, um, the ornamental plants over the last few years. Uh, one of the things that we uh, are just now, maybe I can flag this up on, on the slides, just now looking at is processing fresh herbs. Um, and this is very much motivated by the practical problem of packaging cut herbs. So we're trying to understand, well, one of the things that you want to do in that situation is pick out, for example, a pre-specified amount of, of the herb, right? 15 grams of herbs in a packet, usually something like that. Um, now, if you ever try with a robot to pick out 15 grams of coriander from a bunch of coriander, you end up with an enormous bunch of maybe you know, 500 grams. So the question is, how can we uh, um, find a strategy that allows you to segment or, or detangle those herbs? And that's something we're currently looking at. Actually, there's a, we, we had a paper in the UK RAS conference recently about that, and 
we're putting more out. There are certain, I'm not going to talk about the details, but there are certain strategies that you can use, even with just simple things like parallel grippers to, to separate and um, uh, sort of improve your uh, uh, consistency in that picking. Very interesting. Um, so uh, Fulvio, uh, Fulvio has another question. Do you want to come um, to, to speak about your question? Uh, I think you're, you're, you're online. Okay, so hi Matthew, thanks for the great talk. Um, hi Fulvio. Very simple question. Um, what if the teacher is teaching in a sort of human way, but this is not the best thing for the robot? So what is the way in which the robot could recognize that something is not optimal just because of hardware constraints or, or uh, abstraction or because of the task can be improved in comparison to what the teacher is, is suggesting or simply the teacher is doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Can we recognize that somehow? Uh, yes, you can recognize that. Uh, and actually this is an active area that one of my PhD students is currently working on. Um, so there's this domain of research called machine teaching, uh, which is kind of a complement to machine learning, where you take what you take as an assumption is that the teacher knows perfectly what the uh, target parameters of the model or of the controller that you're trying to learn is. Um, and uh, it turns out that you can, um, in some cases analytically, uh, or in other cases numerically derive uh, a data set that guarantees that you will get the, the same parameters back when you apply a machine learner um, to it. So you need to know something about how the machine learning is working there, and you need to know um, what the exact parameters are. So you have that assumption that you know the exact parameters. Um, but if you can make those assumptions, then you can compare um, uh, the data set that the teacher generates sort of naturally against what is the known optimal data set. And then you can tell whether the teacher is doing well. Um, so there's, there's a, a, an interesting um, uh, experiment about this done a couple of years back where they were um, teaching people like a categorization task. So it was not a robotics task, but it was, uh, so what the people, what the subjects had to do was they were shown pictures of different items um, and what the subject has to do is identify whether it was a graspable item or not. So it was a, a concept of large or small to some extent, right? And they had, you know, pictures of buildings or pictures of toothbrushes, or, or then they had things, you know, which are getting a little bit more ambiguous, like a bicycle or, or a car or these kinds of things, right? And at some point there was a cutoff. Right? Um, now, theoretically, if you, this is a binary classification task, you have, graspable or not graspable. Um, so you know, from a machine learning perspective, it's a simple classifier you're learning. You have a decision boundary. And you can show that the best way to learn what the decision boundary is from a machine learning perspective is to show the example that is only just graspable and the example that is only just not graspable because you know the decision boundary is between those two points. So theoretically, you should give those two as the examples. Um, but people tended to do a different approach. So they would, uh, let's say, teach, uh, they would tend to go from extreme. So they, they would show the building and they'd say, that's a not graspable thing. And then they'd show the toothpaste and they'd say that was, that was a graspable thing. And they just keep on these boundary edges, trying to sort of roughly shuffle the decision boundary around. So this is totally non-optimal, but apparently this is the way that we as humans learn this kind of classification. So that's just one example. I think there's many more where actually um, uh, we need to make a uh, we need to make a concession to the machine learning uh, and the humans. So we need to let the humans know that the machine learners are not learning in the way that they are learning. And that could be part of the feedback as well, because yeah. saying to a teacher that the, 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 the teaching that you're giving me, it's too easy or too hard or it's it's or doesn't make sense for me is also yeah. something. Yeah, thank you. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. OK, well, thank you very much. Uh, Amy Owen, um, do you want to come to speak to us or do you want us to represent your 
question. Um, so the question was, uh, I would like to understand, do the Grover teacher a taught robot have their own vision or any ability to understand what they are seeing or doing? Okay, yeah, so, um, so the vision question is something that I often get asked about and uh, I'm, I, I don't like to dip my toes too much into vision because I think it's a very, very busy field. Uh, but yes, uh, we do occasionally use cameras um, to, um, you know, to interpret the scene. Um, in the uh, experiments that I described in the talk, uh, if I scroll back a little bit, you might have noticed that we have these fiducial markers um, on, the, on the sort of uh, processing table. So that allowed the robot to locate itself with respect to the to the tray, but in theory, you could use, um, you know, ordinary computer vision. And actually, our latest work with the the herb untangling stuff is actually starting to use, you know, some deep learning to try to unpick the scene. So, so yes, by all means. And apart from vision, of course, um, as well, I think that this is a big uh, problem at the moment: is that we don't have very good tactile sensing. Um, so the robot itself, a lot of what people are doing when they're processing these plants comes from their extremely well-developed sense of touch. Um, and I think that's something that we, we as roboticists really ought to, to try and work on if we want robots to work well in this area. Yep, very good. Uh, uh, Elizabeth, uh, do you want to come to speak us? I don't know whether she can join. Or is it just a mistake? There's a, I couldn't, I couldn't hear she you. She should be able to, uh, I'm trying to bring her up. Uh, she should be able to do it, just unmute herself and speak to us. But uh, Elizabeth, if you can, please do. If you can, could you please type your question? Yeah, uh, or maybe she's because in attendees section, maybe she cannot speak to us or... She should be able to. Uh, we do okay. give rights people to speak, yeah. Um, okay, so... Uh, okay. Uh, okay, uh, could you please... So looks like question and, yeah, and then we bring it up. Okay, here we go. My question is about whether Matthew has looked at the human pedagogical uh, literature on teacher training. Yes. Um, so the answer is yes. And I've been very disappointed by it, to be perfectly honest. But maybe that's just the engineering me, in me. Oh, there's more to the question. Yeah, and there's a substantial literature on training teacher to find models of their students and adapt their lessons accordingly. Yes. So um, at the risk of upsetting those who are working in the pedagogical literature area, um, so I find that their models are very uh, conceptual. And for my taste as an engineer, I find that they don't seem to be that quantitative. Um, so, um, we have broadly looked around at, um, uh, you know, these different theories of, of, of how people learn um, and not found anything that was particularly, well, that we felt was particularly helpful for us to engineer a robotic system. Um, I think, and that may be partly because we, um, uh, we're focusing in on motor skills and I think a lot of the sort of pedagogy is about sort of more high level concept uh, learning. But I certainly think that um, these guys might start to feel a little uncomfortable as work in machine teaching and this kind of sort of human-robot interaction 
uh, starts to develop more because actually you, you start to get more testable theories which are not based on kind of argumentation but are actually based on quantitative experiments so at the risk of i mean i'm i'm hesitant to say all this because i don't like to sound arrogant or or dismissive of a, of this but i i do feel it is um, so there's further point to the question i'm just reading it oh yes <laughs> yes 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 so uh yeah so i i totally agree that there is some really excellent work in terms of um uh, building computational models of learners that's that's for sure so the computational neuroscience field um you know this whole area i think is really really good um so i think i've seen two different levels of this kind of research so the the kind of traditional pedagogy um area which is seems to be more of a social science and a bit softer um but isn't really to my taste and then the computational neuroscience stuff i i really i really agree with they do make some very positive predictions and they're very um i think they're very good uh, i can't say that we're drawing on any particularly in this work but it would be uh, an interesting area to to explore further definitely Okay, well, um, I think for the sake of time, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Matthew once again for this wonderful uh, lecture, uh, very first lecture of a CDT uh, seminar series. And uh, I think this was a perfect example of how, uh, you know, interdisciplinary discussions and the, um, uh, could bring in interesting uh, ideas for research. And we learn obviously a lot from, uh, from your uh, lectures and your project in the past. So I'd like to thank you very much again, and uh, we, you know we, we will keep you in the loop of communication of CDT projects. So we'll, we'll stay in touch, and we keep Brilliant. doing collaboration in the future. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. Thank you very much, and I'd like to also remind everyone else to join the next uh, seminar uh, we plan on the 17th of July, 3 p.m. Um, uh, lectured by Professor Simon Pearson from Lincoln University and his colleague. Um, so we'd like to see you again in a month's time. Uh, and otherwise, we'll, um, uh, we, we'll have a very nice uh, weekend. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.